Well, I don't know if that would be con considered a spoiler there, Daniel, to give the answer to the sermon right at the start, but hopefully um, most, if not all, of you knew that there is a hell. However, in the, in the fall, in the mid-fall, I think it was, uh, a person who professed to be a Christian said, oh, I don't believe in hell. And I was sort of struck by that because if you don't believe in hell, you're not a Christian. It's one of these foundational things because if there's no hell, you don't need a savior. And if you don't need a savior, then you don't get one because you don't think you need one. You, you know, it's sort of a one plus one is two. So it got me thinking about hell. And <clears throat> I'm hoping that uh, as I have looked into this, that what we want is to really have just a clarity about this because If you, yes? Can I yes. I was just got a text. Uh -huh. I'd just like to share that. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. No. You, but this is someone who is in need in prayer. Um, Go ahead. It's fine. Um, we, we have a friend who um, is up in Minna, Minneapolis, Minnesota, right? And she's uh, doing outreach to Muslim women. And uh, she made a contact with this, this lady, and um, she just became a Christian just recently, and she's been invited to church, and Sarah is the person who we know. And uh, Sarah has sent out an urgent uh, prayer request here. Um, the, uh, the lady was trying to get ready to go to church this morning with them, and her husband found out about it, and he's... he's uh, He's pushed her and he's taken her car keys from her and because she wouldn't answer where she's going and why she's going there. Um, uh, well, it doesn't know where she's going. She was getting ready to go and he didn't know where. So she, and she didn't share with him where she was going because she was going to go to church. And it's going to be very, uh, very grave for her. So anyway, they're, they're asking for a prayer request here um, so that we would pray for this young lady. She's locked herself in the bathroom in the house. And so I'd like to just take a moment to... Um, yeah, she's texting. She has a phone with her. She's texting out to our friend. And uh, yeah, she's terrified. So if you would pray with me um, at this point, uh, appreciate um, you doing that. Heavenly Father, we just lift this, uh, this lady up to you. I don't know her name, Lord, but do you know who she is? You know where she is. And um, she has professed Christ as her Lord and Savior just recently, Lord, and she is in need of your power right now to come into their family home and to protect her and uh, from from her husband Lord I pray that you would uh, um, interfere with any evil that he might have towards his wife uh, at this point and and just uh, confuse his thinking as far as causing harm and um, and somehow Lord we just pray the Holy Spirit would be there with her and um, and protect her but also intervene in the husband's mind and 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 um, have him uh, come to know Christ as well, somehow using this situation to, to uh, reach his heart and, and change it. And uh, Lord, we just pray for your protection over this situation and anybody else who gets involved, I uh, just pray that no harm comes. And uh, uh, Lord, we're, I'm just desperately calling out to you and I pray that you would hear, hear this prayer right now and, and uh, bless this, this lady because if she has chosen Jesus, she is saved from eternal life in hell. And uh, that is what we uh, pray for, and we also pray for her husband, and if she has children, that they also would become saved, uh, and that they would avoid, uh, avoid the hell as well. Heavenly Father, just, um, my words are jumbled, but my mind is just racing here, and just uh, pray, Lord, that you would just straighten all things out and, and protect her with your, with your great love and your great mercy. And thank you for hearing our prayers. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
praise God. We can have technology like that that we can go to the heavenlies right away and, and pray. Thank you, Dale, for, uh, for that. Um, so, um, so we're going to talk about hell. And um, you could say, well, does it matter if I believe that there's a hell? And it does. It matters a lot. And there's a God and there's a hell and it goes hand in hand. <clears throat> Let's think about a public school room and you have a teacher and you have the students. And you would go to one of the students and say, well, do you have a good teacher? And what if the student said, well, our teacher, what happened was that there were some young men in our class and when we took a test, they were going around looking at all the answers on other people's things. We took the test, we handed the test results in, and the te teacher gave the students who had cheated all A's and everybody else got whatever A, B, C, D, you know, and that's what happened. And then we had to bring in a paper, like a term paper or some paper that we had to write. And one student was on his way to school and somebody in his class took the paper away, put his name on it. They came into class. The teacher said, oh, to the student who stole the paper, okay, and gave him an A on that. And the other student got an F because he didn't have his paper. Then the question would be, well, was that a good teacher? Would you consider that a good teacher? Well, you'd say no. Those students that did those wrong things, they should have been punished. And you'd be, you'd be like, what kind of a teacher is that? And so a good God will not let the wicked go unpunished. And Proverbs tells us, so. Hand joined in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. <clears throat> and so, because we're sinners, we're born and we're sinners, sinners are going to hell. And we need a savior, Jesus. <clears throat> now, maybe you've heard some people say, well, how could a loving God send people to hell? Well, you know, I think that's sort of the wrong perspective. We just talked about a good teacher, and our God is good. <clears throat> and think of it like this. Now, I don't know about you, but I do like numbers. Actually, my family finds that I'm a little, I guess peculiar is the word. I don't know how many of you are like this, but I'm driving, and I do the driving mostly, and there's the odometer. And all of a sudden I'll go, look, it's going to be two, 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 whatever. I don't know. I don't want to make it sound like we have a million miles on our car. So I'll stop. Two, 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 you know. It's going to go two, two, two. And the one goes to two and it's two, 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 you know. And people in the car are very polite. They go, oh, yes. You seem to like these numbers. So <clears throat> I like numbers, but... It's hard for me to really get my mind around like our national debt when they say there's 17 trillion dollars that we owe. I can't pay it. If they come to me, I'm going to tell them right out, look, I just don't have 17 trillion. But I understand 100,000 and I, you know, and then you get a bunch of that and you get a million. I'm still okay. We get to a billion it's an awful lot of millions, okay? But a billion. But when we hit trillion, that's just so many, okay? So many, trillion. I mean, so let's just make this number up. I, you may think I know a lot of things, maybe not, but I don't know how many people will have ever been created, okay? But let's say that all of the souls that are ever born and created 
everybody in the past and everybody in the future, we're going to have a trillion people, a trillion souls that will have been created. Now realize, that's a lot, okay? And they're all going to hell, okay? That's the situation. Adam and Eve sinned, sin came into the world, everybody who was ever created, whoever lived, were sinners. And they're all going to hell. That's the situation. They're going to hell. Their choice. They're going to hell. And then Jesus comes and some are saved. They could all be saved. But let's say a hundred billion are saved. Okay, so a hundred billion and you have 900 billion and you get a trillion. So 900 billion people are going to go to hell now. That's a lot. But 100 billion have chosen Jesus and are, going to, are saved. Okay. The person said, well, how could God send all these? They miss the picture. They look at this and say, well, that's not fair. And they don't get saved. They think somehow this isn't fair. And I look at it and I go, you don't realize how... The, they could all go to heaven. They could all be saved, but at least some are saved. So, it is an odd way to put it, but two things unbelieving people believe. For you English majors, maybe this is a little hard to put. The unbelieving people believe, but then they would be believing people, but then, you know. No, I mean, people who aren't saved, this is what they believe. First, they don't believe there's a God. Secondly, there's no hell. Because quite frankly, once you acknowledge, well, there's a God who created everything, then you might think, gee, he might be in charge and he might have a decision over what's right and wrong and might have some consequence and therefore you kind of end up with a hell. And so the unbelieving people, they have no fear of the Lord. I don't know why it happened this way, but the other night I, I went outside. It wasn't when the wind was blowing like, like last night. I went outside and I could see the stars and things and I went out and when you look out at the stars you realize God's creation and you just realize there's all this aspect and <clears throat> hell is real. Now you realize that hell is in a different plane as it were. It's not on this plane. It's like we don't see hell like we see these things. And the souls that are in hell, we don't see them just like we don't see demons and the devils and things. We don't go up to somebody and see the supernatural. We don't look up and say you got a few people, few demons there, you know. It would I'm glad God has it where we don't see all this stuff all the time. So when we talk about hell, it exists right now, but it's not in the same temporal time and space that, that we're in, but it's in the supernatural. So there are real souls in hell, in torment right now. So hell is real. It exists right now. And there are souls in hell. In terrible torment. And Jesus warned us about hell. And as we'll see, hell is a terrible place. It's beyond our probably imagination or, you know, it's just horrendous. And Jesus saves us from hell. Now, if you don't remember anything else from the sermon, remember this one thing. There is a hell. There is a hell. <clears throat> now, I hope this brings some clarity to your understanding. Basically, we have such an advantage over those that aren't saved, and the advantage is we can find out what's really true. 
Because when we believe things that don't, are, aren't really true, we run into trouble. If you think you're a millionaire and you start spending money like that and then the banker comes and says, you're not a millionaire, you have trouble. So the reality of things really makes a difference. And so we want to be clear because we want to be able to communicate to people what is the reality. Now right now, there is a place called paradise. And there's a place called hell. And in the future, we're gonna, there's, a, gonna be, there's this place called New Jerusalem and there's a place called the Lake of Fire. See, And so you need to understand the differences between, say, paradise like, and New Jerusalem and, for example, the difference between hell and the lake of fire. Okay? So, now paradise is a place that it's, in, you know, it's not the final place, but it's an intermediate place for departed souls of the righteous, those that are righteous, and they're awaiting resurrection. And they're going to be raised from the dead unto life. And hell is the place of punishment of the wicked after death, and they're awaiting resurrection, and they're resurrection unto death. And the abode is also of for evil and condemned spirits, the fallen angels. All those angels that went with Satan and rebelled against God are called the fallen angels. And they've been, uh, they're evil and they're there. So hell is where they are. Uh, and this touches on, in Hebrews, it talks about the doctrines of, you know, not, it talks in the context of, well, we don't want to have to go through the doctrines of baptism and unlaying of the hands and of the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment, you see. So that's part of our understanding, our foundational doctrine that, People die, but then they're raised from the dead. And they're going either into life or they're going to go into death. So that's the doctrine of resurrection of the dead. You know, Jesus said to the Sadducees, you do err, because they we don't believe in resurrection. He says, you err greatly. Now, paradise. Well, you may not have heard, we, we talk about we talk about heaven. But heaven can be uh, talking about a number of things because the sky is the heavens. Okay? And so sometimes when they talk about the heavens, they're just talking about the sky. And sometimes we just talk about, well, heaven's where God is and everything else. But there's, as we'll see, there's talking about the third heaven. And actually for the Jewish people in the Talmud, in their, in their book that goes along with the Old Testament, they talk about the seventh heaven and they have an idea that that's sort of the highest where God and the really elite angels are, you know, so they have their, but in terms of just simply the heavens, that's one idea, but the Bible talks about paradise and Jesus said, you can understand this was good news, the thief, the, the guy on next to Jesus heard this from Jesus. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Not going to hell. It's going to paradise. And then in Corinthians, this is Paul, and he talked about his visions. It's not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And then in Revelations it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So paradise is this place where souls go to that are righteous until the resurrection, unto life. <clears throat> now, I'll talk about hell in greater detail a little bit longer. So that was paradise, then we'll talk about hell later. But New Jerusalem. Now, New Jerusalem is what happens is that God creates a new heaven and a new earth. 
And after a new heaven and a new earth are made, the holy city, New Jerusalem, comes down from God out of heaven, and it is a place where his bride, the righteous, will live with him for all eternity. And the lake of fire is a lake which burns with fire and brimstone is where the wicked will reside for all eternity. Now, New Jerusalem. <clears throat> Here is the scripture. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now, the lake of fire is talked about, and that's why you need to understand that hell is this temporary holding place, and then the final resting place will be this lake of fire, because you need to have that clarity, because it's like, you, you don't want to be confused, and because some scriptures are referring to the lake of fire, some are talking specifically about hell. And Revelation says, <clears throat> And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that wor worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And then the next Revelation. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You can understand, you see, when you die first, and you either go to paradise or hell, that's the first death. The second death is only reserved for those that are going into the lake of fire. That's their second death. And then the next verse, but the fearful, now these, we've talked about the beast, false prophet, the devil, death and hell all into the lake of fire and now these are created souls who are described as but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death so just to go over again what is the difference between hell and the lake of fire? After the first death, a wicked person goes to hell. After the second death, a wicked person goes into the lake of fire, which is the final eternal destination for all those who are wicked. <clears throat> now, some people will disagree with you. There is no hell. Where'd you get that idea? You think anybody will ever say that to you? Well, think about who they are and think about Jesus. Because how do we know anything about hell? Well, Jesus tells us. So Jesus is a very reliable source. He created hell. He went to hell. He should know something about hell. So if you listen to him, you're on pretty good ground there. But what about the people who basically think that they know something about hell? They're not reliable sources. Number one, they didn't create hell. They've never been to hell. And I hate to say it, but they've lied before. So if you're believing them, oh, this guy told me there's no hell, so that's how I'm going to go forward here in life. I say, don't do it. Now, you might think, well, well we, I, I understand there is a hell, but see, we need to really get it, that it's real. It exists right now. I'm sure if Google Map could go there, they would take pictures and say, well, this is where you go in. There. But they can't do it. What we know about hell from Jesus, it's a real place, already exists. Hell has gates, and there's a keyhole in the gate. And the entrance to hell is wide. Really wide. The residents of hell, those that are in hell, 
are wicked dead people and fallen angels. And hell is where dead people's souls are. Spirit, soul, and body. Um, so what we understand about our spirit, soul, and body is that <clears throat> I have my spirit, which the Holy Spirit now is with. Then what's called my mind, my will, and my emotions is my soul. And then I have my body. So the soul, see our bodies die and crumble and go away. But our soul doesn't. Now, hell has gates with a keyhole and the entrance is wide. Now, how do I know that? Because Jesus tells me, and I say unto thee, uh, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So there are gates. The gates of hell. So there are gates. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. So keys, I think there's maybe a, a key, because there's a key for hell and there's a key for death. So that's why it's keys. Of, so there's at least one key. There's a key that would go in the gate. So I know there's a keyhole. Yes? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be referring to a key to get out of hell, not to get in? That's a good question. When this is a key that allows you to get out of hell where you were determined to go. That there's yeah, although if you were going to keep people in some place, would you have the key on the inside? It's still to get out of hell. Right. Right, but typically when you go to a house, the key opens up and you enter in. But I'm hoping to never actually find that out, whether the keyhole is on the inside or the outside. But it's a good point. Um, and then, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be go in there. So, the gate to hell is really wide. So these are some real things that we know. <clears throat> now the residents of hell are the wicked dead people and the fallen angels. Psalm 9, 17 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget. So that's the wicked are going there. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead. So in hell are dead people which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works. And then how did the angels get there? Well, for if God spared not the angels that sin but cast them down to hell and to deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And then, and the angels, which kept not their first estate when they were up in heaven with God, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. <clears throat> so, what about the souls? Well, we know that the souls are in hell because this says, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. So it's the soul that goes to hell. Now, hell is a place, it's terrible, it's terrible. Hell is just horrific. It's a place of unquenchable fire. Hell is a place where wicked dead people are tormented in the flames. Hell is a place where the fallen angels are in chains of darkness, which we just saw. And hell's location in the spirit realm is below. And hell never gets full. <clears throat> hell is a place of unquenchable fire. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And I, I found this interesting that we often read John chapter 15 and talking about abiding in the vine and you're the branch and things. And even there, Jesus says, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Other verses, this is, uh, this is, now realize, this is Jesus talking to real people. Talking to people and telling them what to do. How often you would, you know, if you had Jesus here and you had your life to live, you might say, well, Jesus, tell me what to do and I'll do it. Because here's Jesus. 
What should I do? And this is what Jesus said. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Cut off my right hand? It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The worm is, when people die, their bodies are eaten by worms. So worms are eating the dead. And these worms must be there somehow and they never die. <clears throat> and if thy foot, I'm not going to raise my foot up here because if I fall down it'll not be good. If, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. This is not, well... This is just using as examples. This is God, Jesus, telling people how serious it is. And this is a pretty extreme, that if your eye is going to make it so that you go to hell, he's saying, it would be better for you to pluck it out. In the scriptures Joel read at the beginning, don't fear him who can destroy the body, but fear him who can, once you're dead, can put you into hell as your punishment. <clears throat> now hell is a place where the wicked dead people are and they're tormented. Now how many people remember the story of the beggar at the rich man's house and how the beggar and who was called Lazarus whose name was Lazarus died. How many people remember that story? Okay. This is coming from it. And what happens is that there's a beggar at the rich man's. And the rich man was living his life. And Lazarus, the beggar, died. And then the rich man died. And this is where we pick it up. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. I believe that was real. I believe, I had never looked at that. There's some things that we, like the prodigal son story, well maybe that was real, but maybe it was just an example. But Jesus says, he starts talking, and he says there was a man named Lazarus, and there is a man named Abraham. Abraham really lived. And this rich guy went to hell, and he really exists, and he's in hell, and what he did is he saw Lazarus and Abraham together in paradise is what I presume. And this is what went on. <clears throat> because I can't see how you would go, well, Jesus, was this really Abraham? Was this really, La no, no, I just made that up. That really never, no. He tells the truth, and this is, this is what he told about it. So we have an actual testimony of what it's like in hell, and how horrific it is. And this rich man is giving us, and this is the story. It's horrific torment. <clears throat> now, hell's location is below, because 
that's the way it's always described. Hell is below and heaven is like above. So it's just a question of it's below. So let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. So down into hell. The, ways, the way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he, re he that rejoices shall descend into it. <clears throat> and in Ezekiel, they also went down into hell with him unto uh, with him unto them that be slain with the sword and they that were his, were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. And now Capernaum which art exalted to heaven shall be thrust down to hell. And in hell he lit, and this was Lazarus seat Lazarus looked up, so he's down, and that's usually when we talk about, when we hear about hell, it's in reference to being below. <clears throat> and for all the sinners out there, the good new news for them is not that hell gets full, and maybe by the time they get there, up oh, can't get in. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never sad. So hell can take everyone. It never gets full. So those are some things. <clears throat> now, a day of judgment is coming, okay? <clears throat> it's important for us to understand that we're, we're in a battle. We're in a spiritual battle. So we are on the battleground. We're not on the playground. We're not on a playground. If you think you're on a playground, you're mistaken. We're on a battleground. It's a spiritual battle. <clears throat> and what our culture, what our society, what Satan basically wants to communicate to you, there's no consequences. You can do whatever you want. You feel like doing such and such? Fine. Do that? Fine. There's no consequences. And especially for younger people, they haven't had enough experience to have had consequences, and so they often will believe that. As you get older, and you've done things, and the consequences have come, you start to learn that that's not true. There are consequences. But you can understand that you can see so much of the agenda that the wicked are putting out there has the premise that you can do whatever you want and you'll have this wonderful life and there'll be no consequences. And as a result, all this wicked behavior is going on and then people someday suddenly realize, oh, that wasn't true. I'm starting to suffer these consequences. <clears throat> and why would Satan want to do this? Because nothing's going to happen to you in this life and nothing's going to happen to you in the next life, you see. The ultimate is, don't let him know there's a hell and a lake of fire. He wouldn't say this, but God forbid. They... That's why Satan wants you to think there's no consequences. I can, you know, I can do whatever. So, <clears throat> this is what Jesus was saying. And so, he's talking about there's going to be a day of judgment. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. Sodom and Gomorrah have a, quite a testimony of unrighteousness. And for those cities that didn't receive the disciples coming and preaching the good news, it's going to be worse in the day of judgment. <clears throat> now, Again, 
let's have a clarity about the resurrection. The Sadducees were wrong. There is resurrection. And Jesus talks about this in this scripture. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So there is the ultimate judgment. And those that have receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, when they are resurrected from the dead, they will now have life with him forever. And those that have rejected Jesus, they will be raised from the dead, and that had been their first death, and now they're going to go into the lake of fire for all eternity, and that's their second death. <clears throat> So those that don't believe the gospel are damned. Basically, the word damn means to doom to eternal punishment or condemned to hell. And, and damned basically means condemned to eternal punishment. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. There's one sin that's unforgivable. And it makes perfect sense. All your sins can be covered by the blood of Jesus. But if you reject the blood of Jesus, that sin makes it everything else you're going to pay for. So you can't forgive that sin. Because the whole thing of being Forgiving is you accept Jesus. So what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit is here to manifest Christ. To lift him up and say, he is Lord, he is Savior, you better get saved. Otherwise you're going to hell and then you're going into the lake of fire. And it is horrific. You don't want to go, so Jesus loves you, he's already. You see, this is where the enormity, the enormity of what Jesus did on the cross, what he, what he did... You imagine you're suffering in the lake of fire for all eternity and he took that, that debt and he paid for it on the cross. He lived his life perfectly and he suffered and died on the cross and who knows, that is so horrific but God valued him so and the blood of Jesus is so valuable that that paid that debt. Your debt and all these, who knows how many trillions it might have been, he paid their debt. That's who we have. That's why we, we need to understand hell and the lake of fire. We need to understand hell because that makes it, I've got Jesus and I'm not going to hell. You know, most of the time we don't focus on hell. I'm not going there. Who cares? What it's, you know. If you were never going to go to Newark, New Jersey, I don't care. What New not to offend people who live in Newark, New Jersey. I'm not saying you're like hell, but there are some reports that you have, some, you have some problems there that you need to deal with. But if you're never going to go there, I don't want to hear about Newark, New Jersey. I'm never going there. I, I don't live there. I'm, you know, who cares? So we as Christians, oh yeah, there's a hell, but I don't need to know about it because I'm not going. There are people going. They need to, you to know because they don't know. They don't even believe there's a hell, but you know. So this is part of why we want to understand it so we can articulate it. Because if you have some vague understanding about hell, they're not going to, well, is it real? I mean, you know, it's real. There are people right there now. Souls in there, suffering, tormented. There's a rich man there. <laughs> Lazarus is up there and there's at least one rich guy. At least one rich guy is in hell. Maybe more. So the unforgivable sin is rejecting Christ. But he that blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. <clears throat> See, so we come around basically to Jesus. Hell is real, it really exists. 
It's existing right now. And Jesus has warned us against it. And hell, it's a terrible, terrible place. And Jesus saves me from going to hell. And Jesus can save you. But if you think you're not going to go to hell and you live your life without Jesus, you are sadly mistaken. Now, uh, for some reason, I, I have some emotion here. I, 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 you know, it's one of those things if you ever feel like you're about to cry or something, you, tear, you just a little, and then it kind of fades away. Well, that's what just happened to me. And I, I want to tell you what, what it means is I was thinking about Judas, the man who betrayed Jesus. He is the epitome of the wicked. And it's very hard because there are people you love in your, in your life and you share the gospel with them. And it doesn't seem to make any difference. And think about this. Judas was sitting with Jesus at the Last Supper. He had seen the miracles. He was one of the apostles. He was on the inner circle. Jesus had chosen him. He had seen people raised from the dead by Jesus. He had seen people healed by Jesus. He had seen demons cast out of people. In one case, about 2,000 that went into the pigs. He had seen all that and then, Jesus gives him a warning. The man who betrays me is here at the table. But it would be better if he had never been born than for what he's going to do. Judas's ultimate eternal punishment for betraying the sinless Son of God is so horrific that Jesus said, Sir, not in these words, Sir, what you're about to do, it would have been better if you had never been born. Which is the extreme. You never existed. It would have been better for you if you never existed. That's how horrific hell is. That's how horrific the lake of fire is going to be. When you sin, it's significant. And the, the thing that's so difficult for us is, why didn't he not do it? Jesus warned him. And you can warn people. You can tell people there's a hell and there's a God. and Jesus saves you. Can say, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to live my life without Christ and... Whatever. See, that's what you realize, that there are some wicked that can get saved. And some seem to be so hardened, their heart is so hardened, they've allowed themselves to be so hardened that they don't get saved. Now, we never know. And we're always going to hope that what you're sharing will reach them. But you realize Jesus, who, it wasn't like he had a bad message. It wasn't like he didn't say it the right words and everything. He said the words and he warned somebody specifically, you better not do what you're going to do. And didn't make any difference. He, I guess, that was it. So, <clears throat> is hell real? Yes. Yes. So hell is real, and who we have in Christ, Jesus just, it's marvelous. That's why there's nothing that can separate you from Jesus. And there's nothing anybody, you know, if somebody came to you and said, you've got to renounce, renounce Christ, Jesus, or I'm going to kill you, or I'm going to do whatever, it's like, don't fear him or her. 
you come from knowledge and truth and love and mercy and you say no you could say to them oh my God mentioned you in the Bible he mentioned me in, the, in your Bible yeah he said not to fear you so I'm not let me pray dear Heavenly Father thank you so much for bearing on the cross and shedding your blood to cover our sins so that we don't have to go to hell or ever the lake of fire and thank you so much that we can focus on our relationship with you our fellowship with you that we have now because Holy Spirit you indwell us and you keep transforming us and making us more and more like your precious son Jesus And you are a marvelous God and you, you died for everybody. But we know that you said that the gate into eternal life is, is narrow versus the gate to hell is wide. So many more people are going to go to hell even though they could go to be with you. So Lord, we do pray for those that we love that you would save them. We pray, Lord, that you would use this sermon to have us have a better understanding about hell and that as Christians, we believe there's a hell because you've said so. We know things about it. We know that it exists right now and that you came to earth to save every living soul so they wouldn't have to go to hell and it's wonderful and we so appreciate it and we so thank you Lord and we give you the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus name Amen Four seven, eight.